Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Three in One. We're so glad you're here, and we hope that as you head further into November and the days get a little darker and a little more cold, that you are warm and well. On this Remembrance Sunday, we will continue to explore our theme of faithfulness by looking at words from prophets, and today we're going to be looking at words from the prophet Amos. As we begin our time of worship, you'll see a candle being lit. We invite you to light a candle at home as a reminder of God's presence with us. You'll also see the words to our opening prayer on the screen, and we invite you to join us in that prayer, and it'll be followed by an act of remembrance. Eternal God, on this Remembrance Sunday, we give thanks for those who put the needs of others ahead of their own. Help us to focus on your will rather than our own desires. Amen. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God. Their bodies are buried in peace, but their names live forevermore. At the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month, time stands still for a moment, and we remember those who died, not for war, but for a world that would be free and at peace. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. <laughs> They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. And age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them.
Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Amos. And these are words that were spoken to the people in the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Listen to these words and, and the challenge that they offer as well as the hope that they offer. Alas, for you who desire the day of the Lord, why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals and take no delight in your solemn assemblies even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Friends, these are words of hope for God's people. And so we give thanks for them, saying, thanks be to God. I saw that I was preaching on Amos, I had mixed feelings about it. Amos isn't one of those texts that has an immediate reference point like Jonah and the story about the whale or with Daniel being in the lion's den. On the other hand, I did a two week intensive course on Amos in seminary, so I did have some background knowledge to work with. Amos is grouped together with the minor prophets towards the end of the Old Testament. Amos is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible and all that we know about him comes from this book bearing his name. We'll spend a bit of time looking at some of the themes and context for this book and consider how it might be speaking to us today. The book of Amos was probably written sometime around the middle of the 8th century BCE. Prior to this period, the northern kingdom of Israel was often attacked by the Syrians and defeated. However, the powerful army of Assyria to the east defeated Syria, but did not at this point stage an attack on Israel. So the people of Israel are enjoying a time of peace and prosperity that they had not known for a long time. But along with this peace and prosperity came a tendency not to seek God or God's will. The rich got richer and didn't care about the needs of the poor. They cheated them in the markets prevented them from getting justice in the courts by bribing the magistrates. 
took their land and it even caused them to be sold as slaves. You can read about this for yourself pretty quickly as the book of Amos is only nine chapters long. As for Amos himself, he was a countryman and a farmer from a small town in Judah called Tekoa, which was about 10 kilometers south of Bethlehem and about 18 kilometers from Jerusalem. He wasn't a member of a priestly family like Jeremiah or Ezekiel. Amos earned his living from tending to the flock of sheep and the sycamore fig grove. We don't know if he was the owner of the flocks and groves or worked as a laborer, but he didn't make his living as a paid professional prophet, but was called to prophesy. So we've got two kingdoms, Judah in the south and Israel in the north. Amos is from the south and goes to Bethel in the north, which was Israel's main religious sanctuary and where the upper, upper echelons of the northern kingdom worshipped. Both kingdoms were enjoying greater prosperity, new political and military heights. But it was also a time of idolatry, extravagant indulgence in luxurious living, immorality, corruption of judicial procedures, and oppression of the poor. As a consequence, Amos prophesies of the coming destruction by Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom. The dominant theme is clearly stated in the last verse we heard in chapter 5, verse 24. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The call is for social justice and the indispensable expression of true piety. Amos was a vigorous spokesperson for God's justice and righteousness, whereas Hosea emphasized God's love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Amos declares that God is going to judge his people, God's unfaithful, disobedient, yet chosen people. The Israelites had come to believe that the observance of religious rites at the sacred places was all that God was interested in, and that outside their worship activities, they could basically do whatever they wanted. Without commitment to God's law, the people had no basis for standards of conduct. If we were to read the opening 17 verses of Amos chapter 5, we would notice that this is a lament for Israel's sin. It paints a gloomy picture. Young, poor Israel has fallen and there's no one there to pick her up. Destruction comes on its people. There is the appeal to seek God and live, not offer empty worship at religious sites. In verse seven, we see the dyad of justice and righteousness and the rebuke for those who turn justice into wormwood or something bitter. The poor are trampled while the rich have built houses of stone and have planted vineyards to enjoy wine, but they won't get to enjoy them because of the judgment that awaits them. Those who have taken bribes and denied justice for the righteous poor. Mourning, lamentation, and wailing wait for the rich oppressors. It's not a super encouraging picture, but it gets better and we'll get to that. Amos asks, why do you want the day of the Lord? It's darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into a house and raised a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. That seems like 2020 in a nutshell, right? Dodge one disaster only to be met by another one. The day of the Lord is not going to be light, but darkness and gloom. And then God speaks. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your ritual gatherings. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not look upon the offerings of your fatted animals. I don't care about your songs or your music, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God isn't looking for empty demonstrations of piety, of offerings, whether great or small. It's all meaningless if it's all just for show and justice and righteousness are ignored. When the poor are still in need and the powerless are refused justice and are abused, why would God pay attention to these sacrifices? To bring this back to grace, let's consider how these words from the book of Amos are speaking to us. I know we have some affluent in individuals in the congregation, but I don't think they made their wealth from oppressing the poor. I don't think we're bribing judges to get our way and deny justice to others. 
But I wonder if we've misplaced our focus recently. There's no denying that things have been challenging for Grace in 2020. From resignation to COVID and shifting ministry online, a large deficit and uncertainty about what's ahead. And despite the various challenges presented, Grace is involved in various ministries, from holding a Bible study and now a book study over Zoom to grow in faith and understanding, Dwell Coffee, which invites connection and explores scripture, online programming for children and youth, offering space for the food bank to run in the Beltline, providing safe community and connection with Trunk and Treat, appealing for gifts and donations for Reset to help women who have left the sex trade. I don't want to sound tone deaf or inconsiderate, but I wonder if we have been less intentional about seeking God's will as of late. I think it's natural for some things to occupy our minds more than others at times. We usually see poppies around this time of year to remember the sacrifices of men and women who served in the war. Truthfully, it's important to remember the cost of peace year round, but as a society, we tend to focus on it only during the first half of November. Lately, we've been inundated with news around COVID and the American election, and soon we'll be inundated to shop at specific places who are interested in our money. And at Grace, I think what has been at the forefront for many in the congregation is when we might get a lead minister, return to in-person worship, or deal with our growing deficit. Each of these are valid concerns. And yet I wonder, despite all of the challenges that we might be facing, how we are being asked to be faithful to God, faithful to Grace, and faithful to our community. In Amos, we saw that the Israelites had come to believe that the observance of religious rites at the sacred places was all that God was interested in, and that outside their worship activities, they could do whatever they wanted. Have we come to believe that Sunday morning or worship is what church is all about? Some of us enjoy the brevity of a three-in-one service. Some of us want something longer, and some of us watch a whole bunch of services but I wonder, are we finding ways to connect justice and righteousness? Despite the challenges we are faced with, what can we be doing to promote engagement, belonging, community, compassion, and service? These five key values of our congregation. How, despite our circumstances, are we transforming lives through God's grace? When God speaks in the passage we read today, from verses 21 to 24, it is evident that God is not concerned with empty offerings or vain praise. God seeks justice and righteousness. For us today, it's easy to get carried away with the urgent and lose sight of the important. We've been overwhelmed with the urgent, respond to shifting ministry online, get things going so we can call another minister. But we are also called to be faithful to God. The important things remain loving God and loving our neighbor. And these can't just fall to the side while we get preoccupied with other parts of church life in Canada in the 21st century. But there's hope. In fact, God has a wonderful future prepared for his children if they choose to repent once they examine themselves and get back to what is important. And given the seeming gloom and doom in Amos, it might be easy to see why this text only appears five times over the course of three years in the lectionary. Obviously, the passage was originally intended to convey the sins of Israel in its initial setting and time. But there are important lessons preserved for future generations. Israel was God's chosen people, but they did, that did not prevent them from being punished for their sins. Yet in the fullness of time, Israel is restored. God comes and dwells among the people and invites them into full relationship. Jesus embodies justice, righteousness, love, mercy, and grace. And we are called to do the same. We are called to continue in Christ's ministry, being led by the Spirit to use our head, heart, and hands to work for justice and righteousness and make God's love known. It's easy to get carried away with certain topics, 
But what grounds us, what brings us together as grace is the Holy Trinity. Sure, liturgy is important, clergy are important, those who make up the faith community are important, but God is essential. Serving others rather than ourselves is essential. It's important to remember that God works through unlikely figures. Amos was an ordinary person, but he was willing to carry God's message to those in authority and much more powerful than he was. Amos was faithful to God's calling in his life and called the Israelites back to faithfulness in God. May we be faithful to God despite the challenges we might face. Perhaps these difficult times will help us re-evaluate our priorities and see if what we're doing is helping us move beyond Sunday. I'll end using the same words from my previous sermon. The quality of our worship is not measured by what happens on only Sunday mornings, but by what happens Monday through Saturday. Amen. As usual, we have three ways for you to respond to the text this week. As we think about the challenges that we face ahead, how can we remain focused on what God is calling us to do? How can we live into our mission and values of transforming lives through God's grace and promote engagement, belonging, community, compassion, and service? On this Remembrance Sunday, as we remember the sacrifices of men and women and those who put the needs of others ahead of their own, how can we put our personal desires aside in the interests of faithfulness and justice? This week, consider which activities in your daily life could be worshipful. Perhaps it's noticing when you complain about something. Consider how that complaint could be transformed into something different, like adoration. Perhaps it's taking account of the worries that you have day to day throughout the week. How could writing those down and being intentional about praying through that list be transformative in some way? Maybe there's an activity that's inherently prayerful for you, not necessarily with words. For me, it's playing piano. I know of others who consider their morning run and the focus that they have on their breathing while running to be prayerful time spent with God. What could that time be for you? Justice and righteousness, and reminders are reminders of God's life-giving presence. Amos' words invite us to remember we are worshiping God when we lend our hands and hearts to the work of reconciling and healing relationships with neighbors and with creation. Here are four ways to enter into the worshipful work of extending God's care and love to neighbors and creation. Begin each day with a single prayer. God, help me to listen to the stranger and neighbor I meet today. Be present with people and with creation. Take in what you see, hear, and feel. Allow being present with people and with creation to be prayer being lifted to God. Commit time to building community by learning from someone whose life experience is different than your own. Lending a hand or lending a neighborhood or local park cleanup. Promoting health and wellness and reducing the stigma around asking for help when it comes to health and wellness advocating for someone who doesn't have a voice, and sharing a meal, a conversation, or a cup of coffee with a neighbor. We look forward to seeing how you respond to this week's text. Bless you as you go into your week, thinking about how what we do on a Sunday morning informs what we're doing throughout the entire week. And as you go, may you know that God loves you, the peace of Christ is with you, and that the Holy Spirit unites us all. Amen. Please continue to go to Grace's website for all the latest information and updates of the many things that are going on at Grace right now. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we have our Dwell Coffee Hour. We have a book study on a title by Will Willimon, who will be our Preaching Grace speaker this year. Online programming for children and youth, and a number of volunteer opportunities. You'll also find a donate button on our website and we invite you to uh, make a donation and we're grateful for all the donations that are made. As our time of worship ends, our time of service to the wider community begins. 
You'll see the words to our closing prayer appear on the screen. We invite you to join us in that prayer and we'll see you next week. Bye. Gracious God, may we work for peace in the world, in our country, in our homes, and in our hearts. Unite us as your people to be your good news in the world today. Amen.